And so when it comes uh, to materials, so for this project, we put together a material model that, um, where we combine multiple layers into a single uh, unified uh, expressive BRDF. And by unified, I mean um, that this model works for all lighting uh, and rendering modes. It's also energy conserving, and it handles Fresnel between layers. Um, so, the, so this approach has allowed us to uh, rapidly experiment with different looks. But, uh, you know, if you were going to use this in a real game production, you probably want to bake down uh, the number of layers uh, that, uh, the, that you'd use. And so here are some of the materials you can find uh, in the demo in the video. Um, you know, as you can see, uh, this approach has allowed our artists to represent a variety of isotropic uh, materials, uh, where rough and smooth varies between uh, the different layers. We also support glass and translucency, which I'll go over in a, few, uh, in a few slides. And you also probably notice that we only show isotropic materials, so in the future we're looking at adding anisotropy as well. And so um, I mentioned multiple layers, so here's how it works when we need to, to actually sample. Um, so the general idea is that you only launch a single array for the whole material stack. And so what we do is we stochastically select and sample a layer, and we estimate its visibility like versus the other layers. And so this allows us to attenuate the selected layer by the layers that are on top of it. And so the result is then we then uh, temporarily filter it, but we only store a single value and so uh, for many layers, so we have to be clever about filtering. Uh, I mean, that's the gist of it, and the devil's in the details, obviously, and I guess a full talk could be done on this topic alone, so maybe, maybe some other time. Um, but with ray tracing, what's really cool is we can actually do proper refractions, and so you, know, you, can, you can throw more rays, get translucency and subsurface scattering, and in our case, that's what we got instead of that thickness term of the, that we previously had in Frostbite, which was uh, pre-computed offline and didn't really allow for self-occlusion. Um, what, another thing that's cool with ray tracing is that we can actually have the light travel and scatter inside the medium for all the lights and take shadows into account so we get a more convincing uh, translucent result. And it can also be fully dynamic. So for this demo, like Yohan said, we did it in texture space, but obviously you can do it in whatever space you want or screen space, whatever. So here's a breakdown of how we compute translucency. So for every valid position and normal, we flip the normal and push the ray just inside the surface, just for a bit. We then launch rays in a uniform sphere distribution. You can do as many rays as you want per frame. We only do one, and that's fine. Um, then what you do is you compute lighting at the intersection, and the trick is you sample previous translucency results. And then you gather, and then you can modulate that with your favorite phase function, whether it's Beer Lambert or Heine Greinstein, Greenstein or whatever your favorite phase function is. And then you have a new translucent result. Uh, we then filter the results as they converge over multiple frames. So the results, uh, you know, they, you, can be, you can denoise them if you want, or you can temporarily accumulate them. Uh, if you temporarily accumulate, uh, you have to build a heuristic that kind of works for your case. Uh, it has to be reactive enough for moving lights and for objects that could potentially uh, occlude each other. Um, and in our case, we have a variance adaptive mean estimator that Tomasz developed, and which I'll talk about in a few slides when I talk about GI. And so I mentioned shadows and translucency, and, and so with ray tracing, we get this global shadowing term, and, and therefore globally shadowed translucency, and this phenomenon kind of happens since objects can occlude each other, and you know, I take this into account when we compute the integration. Um, so as you can see from the images, by occluding each other, shadows allow to have more consistent and better translucency, where objects feel like more grounded in the scene. Um, a similar approach can be used for glass, but instead what you can do is you can just warp the ray based on the view origin and direction. Um, we apply uh, refraction based on the good old Snell's law with uh, IOR values for inside and outside the medium, here air and glass. Um, and what's really cool about uh, DXR is that uh, you know if you've gone in and out of a medium by, by checking triangle phase transitions, so you can flip the IOR sign there. Um, 
we trace array in the scene, sample lighting, and then we finish by tinting the results or you can do something more complicated or chromatic aberration, for example. And so for the theme of the demo, uh, we use this on pens. Uh, and in this case, it was a multi-layer material with the ink tube inside. Um, as you can see, we're not handling shadows properly, uh, the shadow that goes through the pen, but you know, until next time. Um, and so, What's cool about this technique is that it works for both uh, rough and clear glass. So for clear glass, you don't need any filtering. Um, and for rough glass, well, we kind of open the cone angle. So obviously, you either need more samples or to get rid of the noise, or you can use temporal filtering. Um, you know, and the examples uh, here kind of show a very simple material model for glass, but obviously you can do something more complicated. And so when it comes to indirect lighting or global illumination um, for this project, we wanted a technique that doesn't require any pre-computation, that doesn't require parameterization, so no UVs, proxies, whatever, um, that works for both static and dynamic scenes, is adaptive and refines uh, itself on the fly. And so we went for a point-based uh, approach where we have circles in the world where we path trace uh, irradiance and do runtime Monte Carlo integration, like Johan said. And so we basically prioritize surface spawning by the camera position, the orientation, and the depth. And so once a surface is spawned, it gets added to this uh, global preallocated array with atomic add. And, and in this case, and the video you're seeing there, I had to slow it down to around like 1% because otherwise it's just too fast here. Yeah, you wouldn't see the surface appear progressively. And so this is what it looks like on dynamic objects. So once surfaces get allocated, uh, they, they, they skin. They get skinned and they stick to them. And so um, I mentioned that we compute surface irradiance via path tracing. Um, and so when shooting rays you know, per frame, we limit the depth of the path and the number of paths that, uh, that, we, that, we, that, we, that we launch. And so you know, one thing that might come to mind is like, well, you know, you're limiting the depth of the path. Does that mean you get fewer bounces? Well, in fact, we reuse results from previous frame. So at one, you get radiosity, and at infinity, you get path tracing. And so um, I also mentioned earlier that we have a variance adaptive mean estimator when we accumulate results and want these changes to be reactive. So the short version is that we estimate a short-term running mean as well as variance, and based on that, we adjust the blending factor for the long-running mean. And so we keep track of long-term bias, and we try to see that if new samples have been consistently above or below the current mean, and try to catch up if that happens. And, you know, obviously, you know, you have to apply this to the scene, so we have binning and culling, and we use voxel grid for that, but that's a bit much for this presentation, so maybe some other time. And the last technique I want to cover is screen space filtered shadows. Uh, in our case, we use, we accumulate those and filter them in screen space, and we use the mist shader to figure out if we're not in shadow. Um, we support hard and soft shadows by uh, opening the cone angle. Um, and again, with a wider cone angle, well, you get noise, you have to filter it. Um, so we first reproject results, uh, TA style, and accumulate shadows and variants. And then we apply an SVGF-like filter that has been super simplified, where we have a multipass spatial blur and that is driven by that variance uh, from the temporal accumulation. And so here are some hard uh, ray trace shadows, some soft but kind of noisy uh, ray trace shadows, and this is the filtered version. So let's zoom in uh, in the details. And so. Yeah, to the left, the hard, the middle, the uh, unfiltered, and to the right, the filtered. And you can see that you get this nice contact hardening while you get rid of the noise. 